Hello and bonjour tout le monde. Thank you for joining our Deloitte AI Institute Canada for today's session on recognizing female leaders in artificial intelligence. My name is Audrey, Audrey Anson, and I'm the AI Institute leader for Deloitte Canada. While the event, this while this event is a webcast, I would like to begin by acknowledging the Indigenous peoples of the land that we are on today. Deloitte Canada has offices with representation across the country. We acknowledge that our offices reside on traditional treaty and unset, unceded territories as part of Turtle Island, which is still home to many First Nations, Metis and Inuit people. Please note that this webcast will be recorded and made available on the Deloitte AI Institute webpage. You will be able to see this video in the language of your preference. Let's get on to our topic of today. While the number of men and women in the world is roughly equal, the proportion of women in machine learning and AI is limited. It is estimated that only between 12 and 26% of women hold jobs in data science. And the numbers are also very low if we look at AI research, with just 13.8% of authors being women. What does this mean? Um, and why is this important? Well, we know that while AI presents many possibilities and opportunities, it also presents several risks, including the risk of propagating and further amplifying existing societal biases. As such, as at Deloitte, we believe in AI being a team sport, a sport where folks from different background and gender work together, looking at data together, looking at it from different lenses and together building sound and trustworthy models. In today's session, we will hear from several women who have carved their path across the data analytics and AI sector. And we'll, uh, we'll aim to learn how they've used their unique journey to guide and mentor others who are entering this field. But before I get a chance to introduce you to these three amazing ladies, we wanted to hear from you. We'd love to make this a two-way dialogue. Um, and, and of course, we have the, the chat function uh, available if you want to type in your questions. But the first question for you is, why do you believe gender diversity matters in the fields of data, analytics, and AI? Tell us your thoughts. Why do you think it matters? Use a couple words and let us know why gender diversity matters in this field. I'll give you about a minute to share your responses. Let's see if we have some responses, Aisha. Looks like they're coming in uh, slowly. It's uh, probably just a slow connection, but they're coming in. Sounds good. So the opportunity to remove bias or the need to remove bias is coming back. The need to have a diverse way of thinking, to be inclusive, to probably provide a different viewpoint, equity as well, leadership that looks like me, of course, engaging uh, with women that look like us. Yeah, equity is trending as we're speaking. You got it, right? We, we want to mitigate those risks of... Um, of propagating the bias, but also providing equal opportunity as well as a diversity of thought. Absolutely. Now, another um, key question we had for you today is how can we increase that diversity? What are some of the ways that you've seen work well in your organization, in your history? What works well to make sure that we are, um, uh, if we think from a woman perspective, right? Engaging, hiring, retaining top talent, how can we increase diversity? If you had one tip, one recommendation for us today, what would it be?
I like it. This session, talking, talking about it openly, making it conscious. Yes. Um, changing the hiring criteria. Having role models, networking, awareness, mentorship, confidence. Fantastic. I think some of these probably our panelists are going to echo and amplify, um, but also they might come up with additional tactics and experiences in increasing that gender diversity. Yeah, thank you for all of those ideas. Fantastic, great. So now let me introduce you to our three panelists who can hopefully complement your ideas here. Um, I would love to start with uh, Shannon, Shannon Bell. Shannon serves as SVP, Senior Vice President IT at Rogers. In this role, she is responsible for all elements of IT and digital, including strategy, planning, architecture, program delivery, and operations. Her teams support the systems and technology, enabling Rogers' consumer, business, and sports and media lines of businesses, as well as corporate, HR, finance, and enterprise data. Over the past three years at Rogers, Shannon has driven agile transformation across technology. She has built out the cloud and data practices and completed transformations of both the consumer and business systems to enable omnichannel customer experiences. As a senior technology leader, Shannon has a proven track record of delivering outstanding results and building high functioning teams. She is experienced at driving successful cultural and technology transformations across large transformations. She received an MBA from the University of Surrey in the UK. And prior to Rogers, she's held executive level roles in technology in North America and Europe with companies including MDocs, Bridgewater Systems, New Steps Networks, Metasolve Software, and New Bridge Networks. Shannon, welcome to our panel today. Thanks, Audrey. I'm happy to be here. Thank you for accepting our invitation. Um, next, I'm, I'm thrilled to invite uh, Rogayet. Rogayet Tabrizi is the founder and CEO of Theory and Practice, a data innovation company enabling enterprises to put their data to work. Rogayet is a tech leader helping Fortune 500 companies connect with their customers to create and delight, um, to create delight and drive value. Rogaye studied her master's in experimental particle physics and worked on the ATLAS detector at CERN. Rogaye then charged, changed disciplines and earned her PhD in economics. Her company is known for its unique pairing of behavioral economics with state-of-the-art AI. Rogaye, thanks for accepting our invitation to be on this panel today. Thank you so much for having me. Um, and last but not least, Lisa, Lisa Muscatelli. Lisa is a strategic account executive at Salesforce, a leading customer relationship management software company with over a decade of experience in sales and business development. Lisa is an accomplished leader serving as president of the Women's Network at Salesforce, where she has dedicated herself to creating opportunities for women to advance in their careers and meet their full potential. Her passion for helping women succeed extends beyond her professional life, as she has also volunteered with various organizations focused on empowering women. Lisa holds a Master of Science degree from Wageningen University in the Netherlands, where she focused on nutrition research and physiology. In her free time, Lisa enjoys connecting with her online community as the face behind Curly and Fab, and spending time with her family. Lisa, thanks for joining us today. All right. No worries. Great to see you, Lisa. And thanks for accepting our invitation. Uh, I wanted to share with you the questions I'll be asking our um, panelists. So you can also think about your own and type them in the chat so we make sure we have time to get to your questions. So um, I'll be starting by asking you know, the, the three women about their career journeys, how they got in this field, 
what key decisions they made, um, uh, who potentially influenced um, some of their career choices. So it will be about understanding what, what got them here. Um, our second uh, theme will be around challenges, obstacles. Um, they'll share with us some of the, the hard things that they had to solve for in their career and, and how they did it. Um, and last but not least, we'll talk about gender diversity and how to promote that in the fields of data analytics, AI, and technology. And so we'll come back to your Wordle and see um, what they've seen at work, what their experiences have been with promoting gender diversity at work. But let's come back with our first theme, our theme of um, becoming a woman leader in AI data and analytics. Um, I would um, I would love if uh, Rogaye, you wouldn't mind telling us about what how you began your career, what you know attracted you to you know whatever your first job or role was, and then how you evolved from there to now being um, the theory and practice CEO. Um, thank you so much. Um, it definitely been a journey. I, as you mentioned, I definitely grew up in academia. I I think. Actually, a theorist at heart, and going through the kind of institutions that I grew up in, it definitely was a very uh, difficult challenge. Uh, I guess transitioning out of academia, and one of the things that was really important for me was to just make sure that uh, in different environments that I'm in, that I'm actually creating value. But one of the biggest challenges that I experienced was communication. Uh, I joke about this and nothing in my education had really prepared me to talk to normal people. You know, I grew up in very technical environments. Just I wrote models and I wrote papers that really practically only five people in the world understood. But just transitioning that out and actually wanting to do something that was just really impactful was difficult. So I got started in a startup uh, out of San Francisco. I moved uh, to Canada then uh, to uh, join Hootsuite. And uh, both of those places, all the wonderful people that I was working with, uh, that challenge still continued. And that was the piece that actually encouraged me to be like, okay, I really need to figure out what is that path for somebody like me, what the kind of skills that um, you know I had, but then actually really wanting to bring it to practice. So I decided to do a little bit of consulting on the side, but then a little bit of consulting actually grew into theory and practice and grew faster than I was ready for. I'm happy to talk about some of the journey and some of the backgrounds, but I think the the main theme for them for me was uh, really focus on communication and understanding the group of people that you're actually trying to bring impact to. The fields that we are working in are very technical, very challenging. You know, just it's so much easier to talk with a few engineers or to talk with um, you know, some other scientists. However, if you really want to bring real impact, we need to we need to understand that there needs to be a bridge uh, between the theory and practice. That sounds fantastic, Rogaya. Thanks for sharing that. Um, Lisa, you're a registered dietitian. You've got a master's in nutrition. You're an athlete, uh, and you now work in 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 software sales. Um, I think one of the things we talked about was you communicating with technical folks. Um, talk to us about your career and and how you've learned to um, to to do that to communicate with people that have a different background. Yeah. Um, and it's a, it's a great question, but when I first came over to software sales after working in, in clinical for so long, it, it definitely was an adjustment, uh, speaking because in, in my mind coming over to healthcare tech sales, I was going to be speaking to the same folks that I was speaking to prior. I was going to be speaking to doctors and nurses, and I was going to be telling them how they can change their practices using technology. But in actuality, I ended up speaking to it folks. And so there was a big disconnect in a, in a, in a large trajectory of learning. I can, I can see you laughing, Shannon, because uh, I was speaking to people like you. But um, so in, in saying that, there was a large trajectory. And what it really made me focus on was um, I have value to, to bring to this conversation and I need to come prepared. And so I really doubled down on how can I be ready for these types of conversations and what resources can I pull into these conversations when I'm having them? So relying on my team, but also making sure that I was fully vetted and, and practiced when I came into those conversations. Thanks for that, Lisa. And uh, Shannon would love to ask a question about your, your trajectory, your career as well. 
um, both Jorge and Lisa didn't necessarily start in in IT or data or technology, uh, but but got here. Uh, what is your respective track? Yeah, I think um, actually my journey started in technology. Um, I started in telecoms technology, and I'm still in telecoms 20 years later. Um, I had a little bit of a non-traditional start in technology. I knew that's where I wanted to be, but I hadn't studied that at university, but um, I had a great opportunity to dive in and learn as I went. Um, and I spent years working my way through a variety of different roles um, in network and then IT and then cloud and data where I'm in my role today where I run all of IT. Um, I started my career in Canada. I moved to Europe and uh, then to the US and then back to Canada. And I think my philosophy was really just to accept every challenge that was thrown my way, um, especially in the early days. My journey with data started a little later than my overall technology journey. And I think that for me, one of my core skills has always been problem solving. Um, and I think that helped me through my career to kind of advance and take on new challenges and new roles. And I have a very logical brain. So to solve problems, I had a heavy reliance on data and facts. And I think this almost obsession with data um, through my career was also tied to my passion for learning. So combining data and learning, um, being able to solve complex problems. And so then as technology evolved and we went through these cycles of, you know, data and reporting and then kind of analytics and more advanced analytics and basic AI ML and now more advanced, it became clear that really understanding first and foremost, the value of data and how you could use it to solve business problems. Um, it was kind of putting two magical pieces together that was allowing us to, um, you know, solve some really complex problems that you couldn't just solve using manual application of data. Um, and so I think, you know, from my perspective, it's, it's really looking at technology to solve business problems. So, you know, when you talk about talking to IT people, um, I often talk to my team about the fact it's not technology for technology's sake. If we're not translating it and using it to solve a problem or drive a business outcome, then why are we doing it? And I think with data and AI, that's especially important uh, because, you know, you can play with data. Uh, there's lots of different ways to distract yourself, but if you're actually using it to drive an outcome, then you actually see the power of it. And I think that's what's made me passionate and motivated to keep on yeah. this path. Yeah, I love that you identify that problem solving skills as essential, Shannon. And it's probably also interesting for people listening, like wondering how to get into this field. That might be a core skill set that you use to um, transfer into this world. I wonder for you, Rogaye, and you, Lisa, um, if there are skills that you picked up from, from university or your first few uh, jobs um, or roles that are now really important to you. Or another way to ask my question is if you think about skills, right, that um, are needed to do well in this field, what, what would those be? I think, um, you know, what Shannon just talked about is one of the most important things in being trained in physics. Um, I can't help but always go back to first principles, trying to simplify things. The problems are actually complex. So we are not just dealing with complicated problems. Complicated is almost easy, but the simple fact is most of times, especially in enterprise, we're dealing with complex scenarios. So not only they are complicated, but there are a whole bunch of different layers to it. So the ability to connect dots a little bit differently to simplify that complexity, I think is one of the most important things that at least I practice on a daily basis for me to start it absolutely way back in my training as a physicist. But also there is another important piece and both Lisa and Shannon talked about. I think as an economist, for me, it also was the art of asking questions. You know, I always talk about physicists and engineers being trained in solving problems, optimizing different solutions, et cetera, as in the problem is given, solve it and try to find the best path to come up with the most effective and efficient way. However, an economist is trained to actually ask the questions differently. What is the question to begin with? How have we convinced ourselves that we are actually asking the right question? Have we actually understood the assumptions that we might be making without even realizing that we are making those assumptions? So, and that is all the different components that add actually to the complexity of the problem, right? So being able to really take a step back, I mean, we talk about intellectual diversity a lot. Like I, I genuinely believe it is so important to bring different people from different mm -hmm. fields 
different backgrounds all together. So it's not just about gender diversity, it's also about the intellectual diversity that is truly is going to influence and help us get rid of bias and just look at the problems from different angles and lenses. So all of that together for me, yes, it did start in the transition that I had from physics to economics. And now all of that is just basically end up happening and getting practiced every day. Thanks for that, Rogea. So we heard from Shannon about problem solving, from Rogea about the ability to uh, make the complex less complex through questioning, uh, among other things. How about you, Lisa? Anything that catches your attention? Anything you've had personal experiences with? Yeah, so when I first graduated from my master's, I worked in research for the next couple of years, and we were working on um, creating these clinical practice guidelines. And you ask questions, and Rogea, this is, it's, this is, what you spoke about really this is where i'm like oh yes this is important we ask very specific questions for research to make sure that we can pull the right data in and that we're looking at the right um, evidence for what we're trying to create but what i learned in that process is that when you are so focused on one specific question you miss all of the outside and so when we talk about technology and AI, and, and Roge, you, you touched on this, like although our questions need to be you know, specific, there you do need to take that step back because you could be missing a lot. And we've seen that with technology. And so, I mean, in the example for this one was we were talking about reflux and there in the, the questions that we were asking, it was negating all of the research around nutrition and its implications on reflux. So it, it was a very interesting conversation, but that it was the most eye-opening moment for me is like, we have to take a step back because we will be, you, you can miss a lot if you are too specific. So in my current role, what I've learned is like that, that curiosity component where your questions do need to be specific, but you, you do need to ask um, and, and just be generally curious because you'll uncover so much more. Thanks Lisa for that. And, and thank you to the three of you for sharing uh, a bit more about your careers and what got you here, uh, what strength uh, you played to. I would love if we could switch gears a little bit to talk about challenges and obstacles that some that you have encountered and how you've you've solved for them. Um, Lisa, something we we talked about is um, imposter syndrome, uh, and would love um, for you to share how you experienced it and how you dealt with it and what your recommendations for our audience would be. Yeah, so um, imposter syndrome is something, I mean, when you have a career change and you're in an area where you're not really sure that you can kick it in this area, um, imposter syndrome can definitely creep up. So uh, at the beginning of my career, I was kind of removing myself from conversations regarding IT. And so one of the examples is this, this panel. Um, when I was first asked to be a part of this panel, I was like, I don't know if I'm the right person for this, you know, although I do sell in technology, am I really a woman in tech? Um, I'm, I'm not sure I'm the right person for this. And so uh, after having the conversations with you folks and with uh, some people at Salesforce as well, it, it, it turned into knowing that what you have to offer has impact and has value. And so uh, I often tell myself, you know, I, I will practice, I will show up, but the major thing is I deserve to be here. And so people wouldn't be coming to ask you if they didn't think that you were going to have an impact uh, as to be a part of something like this. And so that was one of the reasons why I was like, yes, I, I need to show up and I need to, to, to be here. But um, yeah, it, imposter syndrome will sneak up on you and it will have you guessing yourself. And uh, it's just one of those things that I repeat to myself almost daily, especially being in this role is like, I deserve to be here. Absolutely. And I think you have a tip, maybe a tip that you learned as a, as an athlete, right? Uh, we talked about practice. Talk to us about like what practice means to you and how it's helping with um, whenever that imposter syndrome uh, shows up. Yeah. Um, I am the person who practices my presentations like in the mirror before I, uh, before I present. And so what I, I did learn this early with athletics and being a competitive athlete is, you know, you, um, it, it, they say that practice doesn't make perfect, but it makes progress. And the more practiced I am and the more it, it allows me to feel more confident when I am delivering the messages that I need to be delivering. So um, I just make sure that my, my ducks are in a row and that I am ready for whatever meeting I'm walking into. Thanks for making a big case for practice. Definitely a, a great source of uh, strength for many of us. 
Um, Hogaya, you've made some really big decisions throughout your career. Uh, you've switched from physics to economics, widely different fields. Uh, you've created your own company. Um, talk to us about like those could be seen as, you know, big obstacles, big challenges, but you turn those into opportunities. Talk to us about um, how you handle those uh, challenges. I usually say, thank God that I was naive when I made those decisions. Um, joke over the side, you know, you're right. It, is, uh, it was, I remember uh, when I decided to switch uh, to economics, um, my parents flew to Canada to talk me out of it. And, you know, just everybody said, you're, you're, you're studying particle physics, you're working at CERN. Like, you know, I remember having conversation with my mom and was like, well, why don't you do your PhD also in physics and then do another PhD in economics? And I was like, mom, what is the logic in that? Um, but, you know, so there are, it, it, this, there are decisions that we make and for whatever reason, you know, there might be, we may not even be articulate enough to just even um, frame our purpose or articulate, you know, the reason why we are doing that. But just, you know, there's something in your belly, there are butterflies and they just, you just don't know why you are making the decision, but you just know that you have to do it. And, you know, in those moments, it takes a lot to just stick to it, you know, regardless of who says what. And you're right, I had the same experience leaving academia and also starting my own company, especially when I had really nice paying jobs. It was the same moment of like, what's wrong with this girl? Um, but I just knew I'm not going to be able to realize the full potential of what I see. And I also personally had growing up to do. And, uh, you know, just growing a company the way I grew the company, just bootstrapping the company was just definitely one of the most difficult and continues to be one of the most difficult and the most rewarding things that I've ever done. Like won't change it for the world, but mm -hmm. definitely is not easy. But, you know, on the subject of imposter syndrome, you know, when we were talking, I remember there that identify as somebody who's not confident it's not that oh you need to be more confident or something so I never felt like it was about confident for me but even with that I sell myself short and that to me is something that you know the incredible mentors and teachers that I've had had just been mirrors for me I'll share a personal story I this happened in the first four months of the company I had met a CEO of a fortune 200 company I had a half an hour phone call with this oh actually in person meeting in New York with this person and I don't know what got into me but I literally got into an argument with him in minute five of the meeting after like the introduction he said something I disagreed with him and you know here we go 20 minutes later we are just you know at it and at some point he saw my point and he just like sat back and he was like huh and I just kind of smiled and you know shrugged my shoulders and just then he made a bunch of introductions a few days after that, he called me, uh, which was really a surprise call. He said to me, do you know how many meetings like that I have? And I was like, probably a lot. You know, I'm really appreciative of you taking the time. And he was like, you know, I usually know in the first few minutes if I like the person or not. If I don't like them, I'm not rude. I stay five minutes. If I like it and I actually think that there is possibility, I stay 10 minutes, 15 minutes. And he was like, I was in a meeting with you for 35 minutes. I was five minutes late to my next meeting. That has never happened. You better take <laughs> yourself seriously. And I just, I never forget that conversation because, you know, it was just like that moment of, oh yeah, I mean, he even, I mean, he sees through me, like he's just such a senior executive and, uh, but that's for him to be like, you need to take yourself more seriously. What you're bringing to the table actually is important. Actually, it makes a difference. So for me, it's a constant practice. You know, I work with a lot of uh, other executives and I constantly tell myself, like, what is it? Am I being myself? Am I showing up in my full, you know, potential? What is it? What else can I do? And I just try to leave all the noise in my head about, am I good enough? Am I ready enough? All of that to the side. Wow. Great story. Thanks, Roger. I appreciate that. Um, Shannon, over to you. Um, I mean, we were talking about teachers acting as potential mentors. I think in your case, uh, one teacher definitely had influence on your career, but not necessarily the way we think about it typically. Talk to us about how you've built resilience over the years, how you've used your grit um, and your belief in yourself to, to get to where you are today. Yeah, it's uh, it's a great point. Uh, my husband's a teacher, so um, he's had huge influence in uh, in my career, and certainly in enabling me to do what I've what I've done over the years. 
Um, I think, you know, as, as a woman who started in technology, like over 20 years ago, um, it's not been easy and it's not easy to always be taken seriously. And I think that for me, those were a lot of the roadblocks early in my career. Um, and and I, as, I, as I listen to Lisa and Rage talk about their experiences, I think, you know, um, getting that validation, you know, having people that encourage and support and provide allyship um, to you through your career is super important when you're struggling with, uh, with imposter syndrome or with doubting your capabilities and whether you deserve that seat at the table. One of my earliest roles uh, was working in Switzerland, uh, deploying new technology. And when I think about, you know, kind of roadblocks being a young female deploying brand new technology in a foreign country where I didn't speak the language, obviously super challenging. I think over time, I realized and understood that, um, you know, understanding and having a depth of knowledge and the confidence around the technology was kind of what was going to enable me to overcome those roadblocks. And so, you know, I talked about problem solving and I talked about putting the pieces together um, with data and using data. I think for me, that was really critical to build my confidence so that when I had those moments of self-doubt, I could always rely on the fact that I knew my stuff. Like I knew it inside out and I absolutely was confident in the material if I maybe lacked a little bit of confidence in myself. So I think that was key in terms of being able to overcome obstacles as I grew my career. Thanks for sharing that, Shannon. And, and, and um, would love to ask you a sub question in the sense that we have skills and competencies. Uh, and I wonder if, um, if there are certain skills that, perhaps women um, can leverage in, in, at work. Um, you've led many, many transformations, complex pro, uh, programs, uh, a lot of stakeholder management uh, involved. Um, are there any skill set um, that are not exclusively female, but that may be more often associated with females that you have used? For sure. So I think you know, one of the major roadblocks when you're driving transformation and, and transformative change is, is kind of around change management. And I think that uh, one of the skills that helped me in the early days um, and continues to serve me well is relationship building. And I, I do find females can be natural relationship builders. And I think, you know, when you're working in technology and you're having to bridge business and IT, you know, technology groups with business outcomes, uh, being able to build relationships and provide that common ground. And I think someone mentioned earlier, simplifying the complex, you know, for me, that's all around, you know, how do you speak if you're on the technology side, how do you speak to your business partners? If you're on the business side, how do you relate to your technology partners who sometimes speak a different language than you? But I think that relationship building is, is absolutely critical because that will enable you to navigate change management, which in large part, when we're talking about adopting new technology and, you know, AI being one of those technologies, um, it's difficult for organizations to understand and also understand the change management impacts, um, the concerns that people have. And so the relationship piece of it, I think is critical um, and helps you navigate those tough conversations. So from a female gender perspective, I do find the females are much better at that relationship building side, which allows us to bridge technology and drive a better change management approach. So, sounds good. And maybe a theme that is running across the three of you is the theme of translation, translating uh, between functional and uh, IT teams. Um, and it sounds like uh, you've, uh, you've found a way to, to act as those huge translators uh, in, your in different ways, but you've been able to also work across cross-functional teams, I would say is the other uh, common thread that I can see here. Um, fantastic. Would love to move to our third theme and continue to encourage questions from the audience. Um, the third theme is around how can we create more meaningful opportunities or continue to increase gender diversity, thought diversity, because Jorge, you brought this up in this, in, in this technology field, in the field of data analytics and AI. Um, wonder, um, Jorge, do you have a strong perspective at theory and practice, how you're thinking about you know, recruiting, retaining, engaging women, but also uh, diverse talent to, to build sound models. I am, I feel so lucky um, 
in, in the company now because we have almost more than 50% of our science and engineering team is women. I think, uh, you know, I sometimes like think about it, how it happened. Um, and potentially it's because, you know, me being a woman, maybe we got more women applicants, but we definitely went through phases in the company that were, mm -hmm. there were more uh, guys than, you know, than girls. But one of the things that I was actually reflecting on was how, especially in those early days when we were more guys, actually some of them were even bigger champions wanting to make sure I remember conversations with some of my teammates and they came to me and it's like what's up with this like we need to hire more women and I'm like you're voluntold go go start you know hiring so it's so I think it, it was so important to have that I guess awareness in the company of you know just I think it goes back to the core of who we are what do we want to actually see in the world if we are here to create fundamentally different ways that things can be done you know using technology using data using these sort of advanced things that we know is possible okay so how are we actually going to achieve do we really believe that like you know just having a uniform <laughs> distribution is going to achieve that or do we actually want to bring some sort of diversity so I think it's really important about what we stand for and how we create the space for it in my work, uh, quite a few of the technical people, uh, they all came from academic, uh, academia with academic backgrounds. One benefit, well, I just talked about how difficult of a time I had transitioning out of academia. But part of that was because the working spaces wasn't quite built for people like me. Like, But, you know, in my company, we were like, well, we've got pretty difficult problems. Companies come to us. They're like mission impossible type problems. Nobody could have solved it. Like, you know, here you go, uh, kind of. Uh, so, you know, for that, we were like, okay, I'm just going to hire the best possible talent that we can from wherever in the world that we can, and we'll just make it work. So mm -hmm. from day one, we were a remote company. Uh, I rem I mean, a whole bunch of people, women in my team, they are in mid thirties, they have young children. I didn't care when they work, where they work, they were dedicated. They are scientists, they are engineers, they're dedicated to, to their jobs and to, you know, wanting to actually make the difference. So they made it happen. So why would I need to just like put boundaries that would actually impact their daily life? If anything, I would much rather support that. So anyways, right now uh, we, we are, as I said, more than 50% girls. We have, I think, uh, we speak about 18 different languages uh, from 11 different countries. The team is as diverse as it gets and you know, also academically very diverse. We have chem chemical engineers. Uh, we have people with PhDs in mechanical engineer, with computer science, with physics, with economics, and it just goes from there. Love it, Rogaye. And I also like how you talked about, you know, male uh, team members, you know, helping you increase that diversity. Um, love how, uh, you know, ambassadors are um, also recognized. Um, thank you for sharing that experience. Lisa, what's your take? Uh, you know, you're the president of the Women's Network at Salesforce. Uh, what are some of the things that uh, perhaps Salesforce is doing, your, your network is doing to help uh, promote more opportunities for women and again, for diverse talent? Yeah, so as part of the Women's Network, we set up a mentorship program this year. And so what the criteria was in order to get involved in the mentorship program was uh, a first line leader. And then we also have a peer to peer mentorship program. But a lot of uh, males raise their hand uh, as a part of this. And so there's male allies, also women um, were and I had women reach out and like, how do I get involved in this? And this was after we had set it up. So people want to help. Uh, it's just, it, and I'm not necessarily sure if it's the, if you set something that is concrete up, something like a mentorship program, then people can come and, and raise their hand and say, I want to be a part of that versus somebody just reaching out and like, I'm mentorship is something that happens organically. But as a part of the, the women's network, we do have a mentorship program. 80 people are uh, included in that. So we have, um, 80, um, mentors and ment mentees. Um, and so, and we, a lot of those conversations, we send out monthly, um, the conversation starter. So what would like, just to help, because sometimes it can be very awkward, right? Like we're supposed to meet, but it's like, it's been so you're, you're in such a box. Um, it can be challenging about what kind of conversations that you can have. So we do send out some conversation starters and sponsorship has been a big one that we've been asked about. Like, how do I get a sponsor? How do I get people to mention my name in rooms that I'm not in? And again, that's something that does need to happen organically. Um, it's, it's, 
it's very challenging for someone to go up and say like, can you sponsor me? Um, or somebody might not be comfortable with that, but we have questions around sponsorship and, and how you can start having those conversations with, uh, with someone that um, you want to sponsor. Thanks for that, Lisa. Um, so, so sponsorship, hiring practices, Shannon, what, what would you add to this list of, of strategies and tactics to elevate women and diversity in this field? I, I think community matters. And, uh, and when I say that, I, I, I think about building community. Um, I think that, you know, that in and of itself attracts um, more talent and also drives engagement, which I think is, is a critical factor. I heard your statistics at the start of the webinar, and I was thinking about it. And, and you know, while we definitely have more to do, um, I actually find more women in AI, and I think it's because the technology is newer. I mean, if you asked me to find a COBOL developer that was female, I probably would have challenges. Um, but I have lots of female leaders uh, in my team that are supporting AI, which is really encouraging because that in and of itself then attracts more engagement mm -hmm. um, and it can be a magnet. We find our new grads are often magnets for bringing in talent as well. Um, and obviously working with new technology and new technology areas is a great attraction. Um, our Women in Technology program, I'm executive sponsor for, and we have a couple of phenomenal leaders running it. Uh, they recently held Python education workshops that attracted over 300 females to attend, um, which was a fantastic result. And I think it reminded me kind of this, you know, the learning elements critical, giving people opportunities, but also building that community because that community of females that attended those workshops are probably going to set up, sign up for the next set of workshops. And that community will continue to grow as people hear and understand about the opportunities. And so I think that that, you know, helps drive engagement. Um, I had a pretty proud moment recently. Uh, some of my female leaders went to an IEEE event and they sent me a picture after the event. They were speaking at the event. And, uh, and I, when I saw the picture, it struck me that we had sent four female leaders without even consciously thinking about it. There were no males in the picture to this IEEE event. And I said, what a great sign. Um, and you know, what a great sign of progress that we're making um, in this area. Yeah, for sure. We, by the way, delighted to see that your respective statistics are above the average. Uh, kudos to, to the three of you for contributing actively uh, to that. Really happy to celebrate that. Um, I think um, would love your additional views um, on, you know, what would you what would you share with um, a young female or woman professional in the field of data analytics and AI, or or if I can phrase the question another way, what would you tell your younger self? Right, what what one piece of advice would you equip your younger self with? I think um, for me, it would be definitely to stay curious, ask questions, um, learn, continuously learn and challenge yourself. Um, I think, you know, finding and knowing your passion for me, it's problem solving. So, you know, if you give me a problem, I am at my best self. And so knowing what your what brings out your best self, what you're passionate about, um, and then seeking out those opportunities to constantly be your best self, I think is uh, is the advice I would give. Sounds good. Thanks for that, Lisa. Any, any advice for the, the younger you or any advice for some of our audience members? Yeah, um, I think sometimes when people get uncomfortable, they back out. And I, that is the time to lean in. It is the time where most learning will, will happen. So in those times of my life to my younger self, where you start to feel that friction and you don't know if you should like take the dive or like leap, um, trust your gut, but, but generally it's take dive in and, uh, and you'll be surprised bet on yourself because you'll be surprised of what comes out of that. So I've, I've just found that in moments of, of friction, when things start to build up and you're, you're starting to feel uncomfortable, like that's the best time to learn. <laughs> Sounds good. So be curious, uh, lean in, take a risk, uh, dive in and trust yourself. Hogeye, what would be your, your advice? You know, I, I was thinking about it as Shannon and Lisa uh, kindly stole the stuff that I wanted to say. Uh, <laughs> you know, one of the things that I that I keep telling um, some of the younger team members in my team is just be yourself. And you know, I just realized that in telling them that, I just keep telling myself that you just be yourself. 
you know, the delight, the confidence, the prepared, like the not prepared, the messy, like just be all of that. And it's just, it is fine. And, you know, the odds are it's actually more than fine. So, but oftentimes, you know, I find us, you know, just wanting to overly prepare or if you're overly cautious or if you're not leaning in. So surround yourself with the best possible people you find because there's always room to grow. There's always room to learn. There's just literally no top end, uh, but just be yourself. Sounds good. Everyone else is taken, as Shakespeare would say, right? Be yourself. Uh, fantastic. Thanks for that closing uh, remark. Um, Want to encourage one more time uh, question and answers from uh, or, or questions from the audience, I should say. While I let the, um, the audience member type up a few questions, um, something that's been on my mind and I wanted to get your views is, you know, ethical AI. Um, we hear a lot about generative AI these days and, and about the risks it presents. Um, but overall, when you're thinking about the risks of artificial intelligence, anything that you're, that is top of mind for you and that perhaps uh, we uh, women or diverse leaders have a, a role in advocating for and being mindful for. I wonder, Shannon, if you have a perspective on, on ethical AI. Yeah, for sure. I think um, definitely there's lots of discussion. And the one thing that keeps coming back to me is you can't stop progress. And so someone was asking me yesterday about some of the news reports on open AI and, you know, whether there should be a pause in development and so on. And, and you know, I think we all know from experience and, and looking back in history, you can't stop technology progress. And so then the question becomes, how do you manage it? And that's where I think ethical AI comes in. Um, I, you know, I think a lot about it from a privacy and data governance perspective. And also I think about it from you know, the end customer experience. What is the outcome you're delivering? How is that impacting? Is it delivering a positive impact? I think that diverse teams ask different questions. And so I, I really believe that, you know, the power of diversity here um, and having different viewpoints means that you can look at a problem differently. And when it comes to looking at all angles of the problem and not just, you know, kind of the one silo uh, view, I think, you know, you get that benefit. And so, especially in the area of ethical AI, I think that comes to play in terms of being able to understand the potential impact of, you know, how you're using data, what you're using data for, and so on and so forth. Um, it's critical that you have that, that uh, kind of more uh, global view uh, perspective. Um, so I, I think, you know, there's not a magical answer, um, but I think, you know, bringing together a diverse set of uh, viewpoints allows you to tackle the problem and solve the problem um, in, a, in a good way. Thanks for that, Shannon. Um, Holge, any perspectives uh, on ethical AI, how to, how to strive for it, how to build it? I, you know, I look at it very much uh, from an economist perspective, you know, just I remember having these conversations for the last five years, like there isn't a single day that you don't engage one way or the other in an aspect uh, of this, especially we work in customer centric industries, and there's a lot of consumer data that we usually end up dealing with. Uh, you know, when you look at it again from the economic perspective, like there are methodologies for detecting bias, for actually like really preparing your data in advance. To be honest, the part that actually scares me the most, you know, as incredible as it is, the interest that this field is getting right now, is that a lot of people don't necessarily have uh, at a uh, design level some of those harder skills that actually comes and informs how to build models and algorithms that actually would stand to the standard. So, you know, you can't just throw all the data into, into a model, just, you know, take something out of box, no matter how great it is. You really want to have done some basic practices to actually understand the data that you're dealing with, understand the mechanics of the model that you're actually building. So the truth is from the, you know, again, scientific perspective, if you actually bring the right practices to the models and uh, to the design of these systems, you are doing your best at least to mitigate some of the risk that would come. And then of course, then there are a whole bunch of practices afterwards that you have to implement as well. You need to experiment, you need to do proper A-B testing, you need to do proper baselining of these different models. So not just understand the performance, but really understand the impacts of it. So my suggestion, like again, like bringing it really back to the mechanics of how some of these systems are done, let's do it correctly from the, from the beginning and the odds are we are gonna have well, much less of the ethics AI or, you know, the risk around uh, that um, as just, you know, as one of the uh, forefront conversations. 
Thank you, Rogeye. Lisa, any closing comments, final words from you? No, just just on the the ethics component, I think Shannon really hit home what I was thinking about as well as the around diverse teams and making sure that we're looking at the angles of who might be left out here. Um, but when you have diverse teams, then you, you generally hit all of those angles. So that was really my whole thought process on on um, ethics and AI. And one of the things that I keep telling people is if you want to move into tech, now is the time because and this was something that we chatted about was around that lattice. Um, it was that lattice that we need diverse perspectives in this area. So now is the time to, to jump on board because we need all of the thoughts, all of the, the different perspectives. Um, so that's really one of the things that resonated with me is anybody who's looking for a, a job change, like now is the time. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thanks for, um, for your thoughts, perspective, answering my questions, Lisa, Rogeye, Shannon. It's been a pleasure. Uh, thanks a lot. Let me um, let me move on to ask uh, the the audience uh, just a, a quick last poll to gather your views on uh, how we did, um, and then I'm going to share with you some information on an upcoming session also filled uh, with female women leaders in this field that we would love to invite you to. But um, let let us first give you a minute um, to give us feedback and data points on today's session. All right. Um, as we're transitioning from this, just wanted to share that at Deloitte, um, we are running this year a pilot uh, for Women in AI, um, a global pilot um, across uh, 25 geographies. We have about 28 managers in our um, in, a in a pilot program. Uh, we make different uh, sessions and, and learning experiences available to these managers, including academic lectures, uh, but also bring together industry leaders. Um, and we've decided to make this last panel open, open to all. So beyond this, uh, this cohort of women that are going to this program, uh, we'd love to give um, access to this session to all of you. Um, so I just wanted to let you know on April the 11th, we will be hosting uh, Shelby Austin, um, uh, as well as a few other uh, female leaders. Um, and we'll be asking similar questions uh, as well as your questions. So please feel free to, to share those with you. So you're fully invited to this, um, to this webcast um, on um, uh, looking at diverse perspectives or a common theme with today. How can we make sure that we um, value that diversity? Uh, we also have additional events um, that we can, um, you can sign up for. Uh, there's one coming up on data monetization um, on April the 27th as well. So if you're thinking about ways of increasing that internal and external data monetization, do sign up for the April 27th session. Uh, together with my colleague, Harman Singh, we'll be sharing some insights and examples with you of doing just that. Um, unless there are any more questions, I'm going to thank you for your attention. And again, thank the wonderful woman uh, who, um, you know, pushed away imposter syndrome and accepted uh, to be on this, this panel. Thank you for role modeling diversity of thought. Thank you for elevating women in your respective organizations. Um, like the person who are showing their hearts, I'm a, I am truly grateful uh, for everything you're doing for, uh, for diversity in our field. Thanks again, Shannon, Rogay, and Lisa, and have a wonderful day.